just want to let everybody know that we do have a disaster relief fund at the sag -Africa Foundation if you are in Texas and you need help or anywhere else. We also, of course, have a COVID-19 relief fund. We're still, um, you know, there's still a lot of need with the COVID. So if you do need help, please go to the sag -Africa Foundation website. We've given $6.2 million since last March. And of course, if you can help, please consider donating to the sag -Africa Foundation. Without any further ado, I want to introduce you all to the lovely Louise Keeley. Louise, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. <laughs> this is such an amazing year for you. I know you've been two RTS nominations, an Emmy Award, you know, the films and television shows that have been pro published, produced, promoted in the last year have just been absolutely incredible and have gotten lots of awards recognition. But when I look at that, I realize, you know, you have 140 titles on IMDb. You've been doing this for a really long time. This looks like an incredible year, but of course, there are years of experience brought to bear. So I just want to go back to the beginning. And I know you were an actress. Can you tell us why and how you transitioned and maybe how what inspired you to act and then the same with casting? And um, I think like, Anybody here or many people here, you know, acting was always in my blood. And um, when I was really young, you know, I just absolutely loved the theatre and movies and went to drama school and did all that stuff and sort of headed out into the world and kind of bravely became an actor. And I say bravely because I really believe that really strongly. It's it's a brave step to make it's a brave career choice it's a beautifully creative career choice and um uh, and it's something I always wanted to do so I did law as my degree before I went to drama school so um I was working in an agency for a while and we were a cooperative agency which we have here in Ireland and I know they have in the UK as well and basically what that is is it's a bunch of actors representing themselves and each other and what that did for me was it taught me kind of the business side of things so you know, I was doing a lot of kind of scheduling meetings and booking actors for the, you know, for the other actors. And a friend of mine and I just decided one day in 2005 that we would um, just become casting directors. Now, I didn't assist and I wouldn't recommend anybody <laughs> who wants to become a casting director to just one day decide to do it. But luckily at the time, uh, we kind of reached out to people who were casting directors in Ireland and asked for advice and stuff. And they were very helpful. And having worked in the agency was hugely useful as well, because obviously it had taught me a lot of, you know, the bits and bobs that I needed around kind of schedulings and meetings and um, and coupled with the um, with the love of theatre and the love of film and the love of television and the love of text and character. Um, it was a really good sort of fusion for me. So the early days in kind of 2005 were a lot about um, you know, short films and commercials and then one job and the next job. And eventually we got our first feature film back then. And then it was just, I mean, to be very honest with you, as soon as I became a casting director, as soon as I started to work in casting, I found that I had found the right place for me. I absolutely love it. And um, infrequently, <laughs> um, you know, a director way back in the day would say, well, what about you? And I'd be like, no, absolutely not. It gives me so much joy to uh, to see actors, to meet actors and inevitably to, you know, give them jobs. I love it because I, uh, I feel how it feels to have been there so many times. Yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, when you got started, you were doing commercials and short films, and then it seems like fairly swiftly you were working on maybe local casting for American television shows and, you know, Quantico and Into the Badlands. And how did that, though, how did those relationships begin where you became the local casting director on these bigger budget projects? Yeah, I think the first one, Rochelle, was um ripper street and that was um it, it subsequently went on to amazon but it started with bbc and what happens is that ireland is a very it, it we make a lot of television here we make a lot of film here because they have really good tax incentives but also geographically if you think about it we are very well positioned between the sort of uk and mainland europe and then of course north america so you know people don't then we, we speak english and and we have rolling hills and we have sea and we have beach and we have all that stuff. So 
Prior to me kind of actually working on those projects, the likes of the Tudors had sort of paved the way for big international productions to be made in our little small country. And so when Ripper Street came along, I'd done a couple of small television series and I just interviewed for the job. And what happens then is, you know, you get to know local producers and you get to know, you know, it, it, because it's a small community and um, there's a lot of word of mouth. And what I love about those, I loved in that, like back in those days and now I love now when I reach out to other casting directors and they help me with projects. Um, I love collaborating because I love learning from other casting directors. So, you know, people would watch movies on a Friday night, whereas I'd be watching the American casting tapes, like digging in, learning about how other people do it. And, and that's really how it happens. So then, of course, you, you know, you do well on one job and then you kind of it, it, it rolls on like that. And I was lucky enough that work kept coming so that I was able to expand the team. And then, of course, you know, uh, you might work on an American project as well as working on an English project or a French project at the same time. So um, so that's kind of how it started. But yeah, every time a, a project come to Ireland and they would ask us to do the Irish casting, it would be really exciting because you get to collaborate with somebody amazing on some part of the, the world. So I, I want to talk to you about um, your collaboration with Lenny Abramson, but maybe we'll we'll just hold that for a second because you've worked with so many incredible directors and, and I don't want you to sort of share any secrets about work or talk about working with other people, but I am just curious if there's anything you can tell us about your experience. Like my fa- one of my favorite films from 2015 was The Lobster. So can you share any, you know, like, which roles were you looking for? What were the challenges? How, what was the experience? Because that was such a brilliant <laughs> movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously Gina's office, Gina J, the brilliant Gina J's office was casting the lobster. So the way it works, I suppose, is that Gina was attaching all the brilliant lead cast, as you know, so Colin Farrell and Rachel Weisz and all those guys. And your Lanthimos, the director, had this was his first his first English language film and his prior movies in Greece, he had cast a lot of non-actors in roles and he was really keen on that. So what they wanted to sort of structure in the casting process was, um, that's actually quite funny, is, you know, it's sort of attaching, in the same way I suppose that somebody like Ken Loach does, it tends to be a kind of a fusion of, you know, Killian Murphy and then sort of some local people who maybe have never acted or some actors who, you know, will just engage in his process, which is uh, unique <laughs> um, in a great way. Um, what he asked us to do was literally go out onto the streets and talk to people and, you know, guarantee we were actually for real that we were making this film. And of course, they were shooting down in Kerry, which is in the south of Ireland. And when I say in Kerry, I mean like the wilds of Kerry. So you get to the train station and you'd have to get like a bus to, or like a minivan to sort of about an hour and a half through the ring of Kerry down to this beautiful place called Park Masilla. So that's where the whole movie's set and they've got the forest there and everything. So with that meant that we would also um, see people in Kerry. So we were on the streets in Tralee and Killarney with the whole team out and um, kind of approaching people and talking to them. And those people ended up in the movie and they had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. That was a really great blend. And then I have to ask about Sing Street and working with John Carney because, you know, so many of those kids have gone on to just have great careers. And it was, you know, I feel like an under applauded movie. Were you looking for like musical theater kids? How did, what were you, how did you go about that process? You know, I have grown up loving the commitments in Ireland. It's an Irish film, uh, a band that comes together, set in Dublin, very, very Irish with some amazing music. And the Hubbards, John and uh, Roz Hubbard, who also are amazing casting directors, they cast it. And famously, the story is that people queued up on the streets. So when we uh, signed on to cast Sing Street, you know, it became very clear that the people who we cast, the young people who we cast, had to be amazing musicians. So we had enormous open castings. It was one of the biggest physical casting, logistical, mapped out puzzles that we've ever had to do. So we had two big, huge days where they queued up, like 
uh, Freddie and Mark, who were in the movie, queued up for nearly seven hours. And of course, because they were under 18, they all had a parent with them. I mean, sitting down the street on the ground with their guitars. And I think we probably had about eight minutes per person. And I remember meeting Mark on that day. I said, so do you play any instruments? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, how many? And he said, 10, 11. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. Um, so that was amazing. It was such a cool project. And, and the fact that they all sang and they all played their own, you know, instruments and, and a couple of instruments was really very, very satisfying. And then of course, as you say, to see them go on and have these really crazy great careers uh, is immensely satisfying. I love that film. So great. Okay, so Lenny Abramson, it, I'm sure that what Richard did is not the first project you worked with him on. Can you, how did you meet? How did that relationship begin? That was the first movie. Oh, yeah. okay. Richard, yeah, exactly. So Amazing. Yeah, so what Richard did was actually, it was before, was it before Sing Street? But it, but it was after this other film, which we had done with some young people. When I say young, I mean kind of, early 20s you know like late teens early 20s and so I went for an interview and I'd never met him and um uh you know it was really exciting because he was a filmmaker who I admired really greatly and he is an absolute diamond he's a really nice person and so we chatted for about an hour and at the end of it he said I'd love you to do it and actually that was a really interesting process as well because it was before you know can I have a self tape tomorrow, please? It was, you know, I mean, now we all live on the internet, right? But back then, and it doesn't even feel like that long ago, Rochelle, but back then, you know, getting into a room was like, you have to work it out. So what we did was we contacted any relevant school. So secondary schools, high schools, that we could go and meet the, the young people. So we went to about 10 secondary schools. And of course, the world of what Richard did is a is a very particular place in South County, Dublin. So, you know, a lot of kind of private schools, um, which in, within which were quite varied, to be honest, like some of them were kind of more sort of a bit more emo and some of them were a bit more sort of um, like a bit kind of posher, I suppose. But what was fascinating about the process was how, um, how much character these young people had and and the writer Malcolm Campbell was there with us and Lenny was there throughout the whole time the whole process so you know it wasn't one of those situations where the director says go off and bring me your best we all sort of traveled to all of these schools together and spent five hours in each school and it was really cool and then what happened was we saw actors as well and Jack Rayner who played the lead in it had done a tiny bit of acting and you know and a friend of mine recommended him because he said he was amazing and he was and he came in so he came in sort of in a regular studio day but when I watch that film I actually do I feel really proud because every young person in the movie whether they're on the rugby team or whether they're at his party or whether they're down by the beach or whatever it is we sort of found them in different schools and we kind of put them all together and um, and again it's that thing isn't it of like we put the world together and then they just have the best time ever. They just, you know, and they all gel and they just become buddies and they like friends forever. So, um, so that was the first time I worked with Lenny. And then of course he went off and made amazing films. So, yeah. And then of course, I mean, this was your Emmy nomination this year for normal people. And I, I saw in another interview that you did that you had said that you had seen Paul Mescal in the theater doing several plays and I gather from what you've told us already today that you do watch a lot of theater and you do go to the schools and see who's coming so and I think you do have like an exceptional cast when I look at your credits like these exceptional casts of young people um lot most of whom have no credits and of course you know this has made Paul and Daisy superstars so Sorry. So can you tell me about, you know, how find looking for young people, of course, the two girls from Wolf Walkers, we'll get to that, you know, finding young people and going to the theater and going to the schools. How do you balance all of that with your time? And That's a really good question. So I am really lucky that I have quite a large team, actually. And um, there are four casting directors and three casting assistants at the moment. And so 
we literally can cast the net wide in that way. And there's a lot of cross pollination as in information is shared greatly. And the people that work around me are big lovers. And I feel that it's really important that people who work in casting are big lovers of television and of film and want to know who directed something and want to know. And we play that IMDb game all the time. You know, literally you don't watch a movie without kind of checking who anybody is. And um, so, so that's kind of how we do it. So we share that people go see what they can. And then of course it's, it's being prepared to, work harder I suppose as in I'm not suggesting we work harder than anybody else but but you know you could you could say that we'll see 20 people for this part and we'll you know and these are the young people who maybe are around right now or we could push a little bit farther and look a bit harder and and hopefully I'm not saying it would be a better result but a different result so that each result is fresh or it feels fresh or or we at least know that we have um, tried to kind of look beyond and might find somebody, as you say, who's only starting out or who has been working in, you know, has done a couple of days on a movie or has done very small amounts or nothing at all. And they might just be the right person for this project. It always starts with the character. And I think harping back to what I was talking about at the beginning, you know, um, having been an actor and sort of having a feel for a character. I mean, and again, you don't have to be an actor to have that feel because of course we read a book and we have the imagination and we can all feel the person, but, it, but there's a lot of that, you know, there's a lot of how the character feels and, and watching people, humans being nosy and being interested in sort of the kind of the vibe of a human and, um, and just digging in, that's it, like keeping on, keeping on until you find the right one. And then it seems to me, um, you know, I, I want to hear what you think about it, that, you know, actors who work in theatre work so hard mm. that I imagine that even if somebody doesn't have lots of film and TV credits, but you see they've done lots of theatre, does that tell you that you can trust them to go on set and do the work? I mean, yes, it does, but it doesn't tell me that they necessarily know how to do it. Do you know what I mean? As in, like, being on set, apart from the sort of acting for camera thing, which, you know, people talk about all the time, but, like, being on a big set can be a bit overwhelming or, you know, there, there's a lot of people measuring you and, and moving you and marks and all this kind of stuff. So, so that does come into discussion. So for example, you know, if we do cast somebody who is a young person, we'll just facilitate some time in advance to make sure that they then are comfortable with the process which they are about to go into, you know? So, so knowing people in that way is really important to make sure that nobody's thrown into anything that they, uh, feel scared about in any way, you know? So we kind of just think about that stuff. One of the most exceptional indie films I think I've seen this year is Herself. Um, I think it's brilliant because it's obviously very low budget. Mm -hmm. And I know that Claire Dunn, who plays the lead perfectly, immaculately, um, wrote the project. So it's obviously a passion project, which yeah. probably was years in the making. Um, can you explain what that relationship is like when you're working with an actress who's going to be the lead, who's written the project, who's obviously deeply invested, yeah. and then you're going to bring her vision to life? And again, that was one of, one of the films where the real people seem so real. So can you tell us about that casting process? Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, that was amazing. As in, Claire is just, you know, she's a really honest, truthful, wonderfully warm person. And you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the first meetings that we had and the director, Philida Lloyd, was involved at every time, at every point as well. And Claire and Philida knew each other because they'd worked with each other in the theater prior. And so they were very close. Um, and she, like Claire was just immensely generous. She would sit in in early meetings and, um, you know, lists and talking about who might play who and how this character feels and, and what this, and she was entirely open, hugely respectful of actors because of course she is one. And, um, and then, you know, you kind of, you cast the sort of 
like the Condeth Hill role or the Harriet Walter role, you know, and then we get into the kid casting. So then she'll watch all the tapes as Felita would and spend a lot of time. There was a lot of recalls for, for those girls, you know, and, um, and a lot of fun. And she would get right in there. I mean, she was improvising with them and, you know, being really complimentary when they were playing together and just, it was adorable. Um, and then when it comes to the sort of, the group who kind of build the house, which, you know, was in the trailer, I'm not giving anything away, but um, that was just, sort of on the ground looking for really fine actors who again you know may not have done a huge amount but representing a very multicultural Ireland and um, really cool vibes I mean the the cast of herself for me is something that I'm really proud of and the quality or the vibe I suppose you know in that entire project was really lovely it was great and um and it's a huge testament to Claire that she wrote it it just is um and to Felida who's just wonderful as well and the great Harriet Walter <laughs> great Harriet Walter <laughs> scenes just kill me I know yeah. yeah okay so also this year you have another ridiculous cast in Wild Mountain Time so obviously written and directed by John Patrick Shanley, I'm assuming that Christopher Walken, Emily Blunt, Jamie Dornan came in with John. Yes. But then I'm looking at these other amazing actors, Deborah Malloy, and then this huge list of Irish actors who literally have no credits, but did this beautiful job of creating this tapestry. I just, how do you have that faith, that instinct? How did that <laughs> How did those auditions, you know, how did that work? Yeah, I mean, those actors are people who are just like a lot of people who work in the theatre, because, of course, we have that big tradition over here. Um, I've known those actors for years. And I mean, because the, you know, the movie was originally a play and because John Patrick Shanley is so well regarded. And then of course you hear about all these big stars, you know, that was an absolute delight. And again, he is just so generous. And I mean, we had a lot of fun, you know, casting the young versions of Jamie Jordan and Emily Blunt, like it's tons of they fun. They were adorable. And, um, yeah, they're so adorable. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that I just think about that and I just think it was an absolute pleasure. <laughs> um, I suppose I've been living in this community for such a long time that I've seen those actors on stage. Barry McGovern, who's in it, for example, he's just a complete aficionado on Beckett. I mean, amazing Beckett work. So, um, so yeah, that's that was one of my It was a delight. All right. So one last thing I want to touch on before we go into the chat and we're going to ask all of the actors questions. Um, you know, we've talked so much with you about, you know, young people, the, you know, young Anthony and young Rosemary and Wild Mountain Time. And the two young actresses, Wolf Walkers, for anybody who doesn't know, is I think one of the best animated movies this year on Apple TV. And there are two young actresses who have been much talked about, Eva Whitaker and Anna Neefsi, who play Meeb and Robin, who are absolutely astounding. I mean, I just feel like I'm going to tear up thinking about their performances. And again, this huge cast of voice actors um, who all do an incredible job to tell this story. And again, who most of whom... <laughs> you probably know them, but we didn't. So yeah. is voice casting different? And how did, you know, how did you trust those little girls? I mean, it was so much work. Yeah, um, that was the first time I ever had done any voice casting, actually. Um, we started, well, it was kind of a, it was like a two lane sort of motorway uh, in a casting process because I think Sean Bean was probably the first person who was attached and, um, because he's from the right part of England and because he's just got this gorgeous vibe and um, and is rather well known and you know so so that was really great once we had um, once we had him attached and at the same time um, we did a big old child casting so we looked for um, for the two girls um, and Honor obviously came from England and Eve, Eva came from from Ireland and we saw them in real life. It was prior to, you know, they had done some kind of like sketchy drawings that they showed us what they were going to look like and all that stuff. And 
once we got the girls in the room together and we found the sort of perfect pairing and they went to Kilkenny where the place where the film is animated and actually based in as well um, with Cartoon Saloon and uh, and they were there for about a week I think so so what the filmmakers were very clever with was allowing the girls to become really good pals and not just sort of scheduling them into sort of a two hour session in a booth. They spent a lot of time with them. And, and I think, I mean, Kilkenny itself is absolutely gorgeous. If anybody has ever come to Ireland, you have to go there. It's just the most beautiful city. And because they have the studio down there and it's just, it's got this castle and it's just gorgeous. So I think that was a lovely way and, you know, Sean Beam was down there for, for a few days as well to kind of take time and, you know, get the right result, but also make sure that they are, you know, having having a really good time there. And then, of course, the rest was just a delight. We have Maria Joel Kennedy in there, who I'm a huge fan of, obviously, from the commitments. And um, thinking about voices, I mean, Eva is just, we just her voice is just so cute because she's got that lovely little gravel which I think matches really well with the character so um and Honor's got that real northern like the, the voice which is just awesome um and then we have a comedian in there called Tommy Tiernan uh Tommy Tiernan who just does a really funny turn as well so that was a delight yeah <laughs> um so one question I have is about the timeline when they're actually laying down the voices for that animation is yeah. it very different from live action movies yeah so it, i mean it's it's long so i think i mean my goodness when did we cast wolf walkers definitely a year and a half definitely two years ago i mean for sure it was a long time ago um and then they and then they start in earnest yeah okay so some questions from the chat whitney b asks <clears throat> are there any particular types of training that you look for or particular schools teachers coaches I don't know if you can actually name anyone, but um, um, types of I training. Mean, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there are so many different types of training and and people talk about, I suppose, what works best for them, you know. And so I feel like training is always really very helpful, especially if it sort of keeps your skills fresh and gives you what you need Um and I would just say whatever, you know, whatever is best for you, you know. Okay, great. Um, Eileen asks, is there a lot of work in Ireland for Asian Americans with Irish citizenship? Um, and would they need an Irish accent? Um, well, the short question, the short answer is I would think so. You know, if you have citizenship, if you have a visa to work here. And the and the other answer, probably not. We do a lot of work um, with people. We look for North American accents. Um, so yeah, I don't see why not. Okay. I mean, there is the sort of you know, the practical question of, you know, hiring locally, as they say. But of course, you know, you, you work that out down the line. Yeah. So I think actually we have Casey and quite a lot of actors are asking in the chat um, about American actors working in Ireland. Um, and I don't know if you can tell us anything, if you if you know anything about I think people are confused, you know, with, with Brexit and all of that stuff, like what, you know, papers you might need to, to work in Ireland. Do you have any? Yeah. That's no a really good question because somebody um, somebody said on a meet at a meeting I was at yesterday I think um, my understanding is that you would have to have a visa for sure yeah and I'm not entirely sure I mean you know one hears the story about the production company helping with the visa but I I think that's kind of later down the line isn't it yeah it's like I suppose if you know actors in Ireland go to the United States they have to kind of get their papers, don't they, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, and you mentioned that local hire, you know, local hire is often advantageous, of course. Um, I, there's a question in the chat from Catherine Campion, who um, is also asking about, and I wonder if this has changed sort of, you know, we've been in this pandemic for a year, so there's almost a new working normal as production, you know, is functioning in different places at different levels. 
And one of, one of her questions is about suggestions for reaching out to agents, casting directors, and production companies in Europe. And I'm wondering just if that looks different now than it might have a year ago. And what, what do you consider appropriate if people want to approach you or get on your radar? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't see why not. I think... You know, I suppose your guess is as good as mine insofar as if you look at the kind of, you know, the geography of where stuff is getting made, um, you know, one assumes that, you know, there's still a lot getting made in the United States, in Canada, for example, because, you know, they make a lot over there. Um, but equally, there is a lot getting made here. Um, there seems to be a lot getting made still in Britain. Um, so, you know, and and hopefully between Ireland and the UK, we have, um, you know, a fairly good working relationship. So, so there, you know, there won't be too many difficulties down, difficulties down the line. Um, but if your desire is to reach out to you know, casting directors in Ireland or the UK or France or Spain, I don't see why not. But, you know, it does reflect back then to what we were just talking about, about papers and, you know, being able to work over there. Um, because I think that probably would be a prerequisite, um, you know, a lot of the time. Yeah, right. yeah. But as regards kind of getting yourself out there and connecting with people, I don't see why not. People get in touch with us all the time. And, um, and you know, we were saying earlier, we live in the world of internet. It's um, uh, an email with your, you know, and people in North America get in touch with us all the time and just send their CV and their link and just even to say hello, you know? So for sure. That's great to know that it doesn't have, just have to be the submission for a specific role and audition. It can be an, a general introduction. Um, Robin yeah. Reed has a question about um, it's the way you work when you're the local casting director with maybe a North American like a Gina or a Gina J in Britain or a you know someone yeah. in North America um, and I wonder if this works differently on different projects but Robin is asking about picks whether or not you send your choices after you've received tapes audition tapes do you send your choices straight to the producers or do you send it to the lead casting director and then make a decision together before yeah, it that's goes? a good question sure uh, I mean it depends so um if for example on a project that we did recently that we had a team around the world look for a particular character for us that those tapes were all fed to us and we would then sort of liaise with them directly and ask, you know, what about this person or how, like, tell me about this person or any more information. So it would be fed to the lead casting director. Um, and then, of course, there's other jobs where you might be co-casting something and that's different. But collaborating is collaborating it, it, like as in the word itself you know because so so for example if I am Ireland and you know and we are um, looking for somebody in this country the person who is the lead casting director will more often than not sort of um, trust us and ask our advice and our our tops will be kind of you know will be like astutely kind of examined you know because we're there because we're the ones that they want in this territory if that makes sense you know, so there is a lot of discussion. It, it would never be a case that you just sort of fire your, you know, 20 people over and you never hear about it again. It just doesn't work like that. A question from Alexandra. Alexandra, I hope I'm not going to ruin your name, but Afria, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly, so please forgive me. Um, she's saying that she's had the pleasure of um, auditioning for you for several projects. And she's asking, what is, can you shed some light for us on the process from a casting perspective, once an actor has been penciled, you know, mm. I think more mm. actors are penciled than the actor who's going to get the job. So what is that final, once you've been pro penciled, what, yeah, what is that process? What's happening on your I mean, end? Yeah, I mean, you know, a pencil is a very strong indication that you are on a short list. And what it means for us is, it, it sort of reaches out and it and it says 
we really like you. We haven't made any decisions yet, but please don't go anywhere. So, you know, it's two things. It's we really like you, but it's also, dear agent, please liaise with us if any options or offers or, you know, anything that will conflict dates wise will come up between now and when a final decision is made. So that's what it is. So it's essentially letting you know at that point. And it's, and it's tough because of course, if you receive it in a, well, I would assume it, it's quite an exciting thing to happen because, you know, it, we really like it, you know, you're, you're on a short list. And then it's a bit of a waiting game. And sometimes it can take a while, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, Angel has a question about tapes and submission deadlines. She has been advised in the past that if you can, it's better to get it in as early as possible, regardless of the deadline. Do you think that's true? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, if the deadline is Tuesday and you get it in on Wednesday or on, <laughs> if you get it in on Monday, then it's actually great because, you know, we've probably seen it first. Yeah, great. And then we have a question about slates. Oh, gosh. I'm also apologizing if I mispronounce your name. I think it's Shalmara is asking um, what your preference is with slates. And if you can tell us, do you like your slates to be separate from the clips before the performance, after the performance? Are there any notes that you specifically give about slates? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, it depends on the project, but um, you know, anything that is associated with the studio, they do require a slate, as you know. So I prefer the slate to be a separate clip um, and if it's not a separate clip, to be at the end. Because what I want to watch is the acting part, um, you know, and, and the scene too and everything. And then, of course, we'll get to the slate, which is really valuable because it tells us all the bits and bobs that we need. If you can keep them separate, then that is better because the way that our system works and the way cast it works and, you know, you can just pop it up at the end. So it is there. But um uh, yeah, that's what I would say. The, the beginning is just a little bit trickier because, you know, we just don't need it at that point. <laughs> okay. And then Tamara or Tamara Wright um, is asking about marketing materials, um, headshots, demo reels, resumes. You know, she's asking, do you like, do you need actors to have a website? Do you look at their websites? Do you like a composite sheet? You know, how important is branding and what they send you? So it's sort of a very big, lots of questions about marketing materials. Yeah. Um, I think there is nothing wrong with a bit of simplicity. Now, territories are different. So it might be a requirement, you know, in the United States because it's so much, I mean, it's such an enormous country with such a vast amount of um, talent and, you know, and it's just huge. Um, but in my world, you know, a link to your CV and headshot and to your showreel. So we work, you know, obviously a lot of the UK actors um, would work on Spotlight. So a Spotlight link is absolutely fine. The American equivalent is absolutely fine as well. If you choose to have a website, I mean, that's great. Like as in, you know, we can have a little look and, you know, there'll be some materials on there. Um, but whatever it is, you know, simple is absolutely fine. You know, I don't think you need an enormous amount. If your agent has a press pack for you, which obviously a lot of them do, um, I think that's great. And sometimes we request it, you know, at a, a particular point in the process, you might want to sort of find out more, pass out more information from uh, to the producers about the person. Um, but we definitely don't need it at the beginning. Okay. Especially because everyone's on IMDb, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, everybody make sure you have a picture on IMDb. Um, so Cynthia Santiago is asking more specifically just about the headshots. And, you know, is it, should she have different characters? You know, should it be natural and real? Should it be glamorous? You know, what is your feeling about headshots that actors should have in their arsenal? Um, again, I think that um, countries may vary, but in Ireland and the UK, um, we just require the person to actually just have a picture which looks like themselves, you know? So, um, I don't need characters. Um, if anything, you know, I don't 
need the sort of more glamorized version either. I think something simple is great. Something which is basically just a photograph of you. Because I always say to actors, you know, your work will speak for itself. Your photograph doesn't need to show me the sort of villain or show me the, you know, the rose or whoever it is. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think somebody who's confident that their work is really good, which I believe it is, will be, you know, enough will be said with your work and your photograph is just a nice picture of you. Sophia Silva has a question. Um, you know, I don't know if you can distill this. She's asking whether or not, you know, what sparks a connection between you and the actors, especially young ones? Is there something you can distill or put your finger on that really ignites that connection? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it is intangible sometimes, isn't it? It's um, it's a moment in time. It's it's the right person for the right project at the right moment, and it's chemistry with the other actors. And um, I mean, I love people. I like and I love actors. And so, you know, having a chemistry with an actor like for me to like a person is really easy and to admire their talent is really simple because I do and I'm constantly really impressed by how how brave and how um, immediate performances are. As regards casting the person at that time and particularly, you know, when it comes to the likes of, you know, people who are starting out or whatever, it's very much... Um, to do with the feeling of the character, the feeling of the actor, and then the feelings of the actors together. Um, you know, for normal people, like we've talked a lot about the fact that, you know, there was chemistry reads and um, and it was just really important that the two actors who played Daisy and, uh, or played Marion and Connell, um, you know, had the chemistry themselves rather than a chemistry with me. Do you know what I mean? That, right. That, you know, that's where the magic lies, I think. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So on that note, when you have, you know, a couple of actors who are really close um, to a couple of different roles, I don't know, with normal people, did you have chemistry reads? And, and is that, you know, do you usually have chemistry reads? And how is that process different from the original self-tape process? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, I mean, the original sort of in-the-room self-tape process, um is you know the actor the reader I will never read with you <laughs> if I do meet you in real life um uh, I'm much happier watching so there will be an actor reader there and we'll shortlist the you know the people who we think are more suitable for the role at this point um and you know if there are two characters whether they are you know, people in their 50s or whether they're people in their 80s or people in their 20s or, you know, like kids. Um, and if the story is about their relationship, then I feel it benefits greatly from getting them into a room and and just playing a couple of scenes together. So it could be sort of, you know, three for this character and three for this character. And we do a little bit of a mix and match and the actors are very patient around that. Um, like obviously nobody can get into a room nowadays right so um so what we've been doing um is we've been chemistry reading over zoom which surprisingly works very very well so um i mean normally the internet is fine um so uh it's so yeah it's amazing if you just you know the two actors as long as they're present and comfortable and they can hear each other and they can engage with each other. And obviously we can all be absent as regards cameras and mics and all that kind of stuff. And they can just be together and be present and we can witness that in real time. Um, we can, we're very lucky that we can get some really lovely results. Yeah, that's great to know. Um, social media. Um, I think Cynthia Santiago asked, how important is it that you are on these different platforms and that you have a following? Um, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I mean, I can't answer for other casting directors um, or producers for that matter, but we don't discuss if the actor's on social media or if they have 10 followers or whether they have 50,000 followers or, 
um, there's never a decision made based on the amount of followers you have on Instagram or Twitter. Um, it's, you know, it kind of doesn't come into it really. Do you know? Mm-hmm. Yep, we're all happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. um, do you have a question from um, someone, I, I don't see their name, but um, it's about older, older actors and, yeah. you know, how to create more opportunity you know, or do you see more opportunity for older actors in the projects um, that you're casting? I mean, you know, I think hopefully people are um, really clever about scripts and are telling stories now which um, engage um, characters of all ages. I think um, there's certainly in Ireland, um, I'm working on a project at the moment, a movie, and it's an independent film. And um, there are five lead characters. Uh, one is a male. He identifies as a male uh, in his sort of early 40s. And then three ladies, four ladies who are um, uh, in their 80s. And it's the most wonderful script. Um, it's just lucky that, you know, I mean, they're they're just brilliant characters. It's lucky that, you know, that that it comes along and that there are people who are smart enough to be telling stories, you know, about people of all ages. And, and I really hope that that continues because for sure, um, you know, we benefit from watching it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and then I'm wondering, when you first receive a script, like something like normal people, you know, whether you have this amazing script from Sally Mooney from, a, from, you know, and I think you're doing conversations with friends as well. So you have this amazing source material, almost legendary, <laughs> even though it's fresh material. When you first get the script, can you explain to us how you break that down and how you break the characters down and do you go back to the source material before you create those character breakdowns yeah um i mean when it came to conversations and normal people absolutely you you know before the project starts i will have read the book definitely three times as the project continues i keep reading the book um and like all television you know you'll get sort of early drafts of the first few episodes at the beginning and then they'll like depending on the the timeline they'll like the later drafts will follow as well um but normal people was a real luxury because the story is told from Marianne's point of view right so you literally you're inside her head I mean you just can't buy a character brief like that you know um luckily um the the sort of the screenwriters um were like like were like they they connected with the book and they and the story that was on television was the story that was the book do you know what I mean like they yeah. they actually respected the book enough to kind of create a television series out of it and the same has happened with conversations so for sure I mean I've read conversations with friends at least 20 times at this stage. You kind of have to go back and, you know, and, and as you're sort of navigating the world and um, and in the same way that normal people is a, a journey, you know, we, we, we physically move from Sligo over to Dublin and, and it's an age journey and it's, and it's like anything, there's an arc in there, there's a story to be told. Um, you, you know, if there is a book available, it's, it's a luxury to be able to walk that path while and remind yourself of where everybody is because of course you might have watched a hundred tapes or two hundred tapes and sort of lose your way a little bit. So you know on a Saturday afternoon you just kind of get in there again and have a think about it, you know. I do wonder how you break down how you break down that stuff. And also, you know, with normal people it was kind of amazing how little dialogue there was. So mm-hmm. little dialogue and yet you felt like you understood what they were thinking and what they were feeling the whole time. And I think sometimes in auditions, the behavior, you know, the time spent when you're not actually speaking is often the trickiest to nail in auditions. So do you have any insight that you can share about, you know, especially with co-star roles when you might just have one line, but then, you know, you might be a student and you're around, you're at parties, you're here that, you know, can you share any insight about the behavior in auditions? Um, I mean, 
the first thing that I think about when you ask that question is how I feel if I was that person in the audition for one line for that role. And obviously we've all been there for sure. I mean, my initial feeling is nerves, you know, that you're there and, and, and when do I get to my bit? When do I get to my part? When can I sort of do it? I would say it helps me. And this is all I can sort of impart because of course I go for interviews for jobs and, um, and what I do is, and it sounds light, but it's actually true. I just prepare. Like I really, really prepare. And, you know, if you haven't been given a script and you've give, been given a set of sides and there's one line in it, but the director has made three films, then you watch them, right? And you probably have heard this um, advice before, but, you know, when you meet the person and they are a person and they, you know, have families and dogs and, you know, and 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 real life stuff that, um, that people want to talk about because we're all human, it might be interesting to, you know, talk about the movie you've just watched, and, you know, and just kind of express your compliments to it or have a question around it or, you know, engage the person as 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 a human. And then, of course, I can sort of sit back and and, and let you guys talk, you know, um, sometimes that's not possible. I understand that. Um, as regards what else we can do. I would say in as much as possible, you've done your preparation, you're there for a reason. And if you can put the little nervous voice out of your head, then you just listen. So try to hear what you're being told, try to hear the words. And if you don't hear them, ask again, so that when it is your time, you know exactly what, where you are, you know, take your time. Um, I say that, and I'm quite sure there are tons of people here who are saying, but we're only given three minutes, and, and I understand that as well. I totally do. Um, if I were in your position, I would just consume a much as much information and movies and television as I possibly can around this person or this project so that you are armed, I suppose, you know, armed with information and armed with, with interest. That's great advice. Alexandra is acknowledging that you've given a lot of actors their big breaks. And she asks, you know, apart from that, what gives you great job satisfaction? Um, you know, I, I always, I think the best part, <laughs> the best part is when I go to the read through, because the read through is, is such a fascinating um thing I suppose it's such a fascinating day because it feels like there's that sort of nervous energy in the room it's like day one everybody is so excited and that's the directors and producers included because we've all had this we've all kind of been together on this journey watching these tapes and getting really excited about who the cast is and to see everybody at the table and the actors are nervous and they they're so excited to meet each other and then they just read the piece and there's a huge sense of satisfaction um, watching them, listening. That's like, I love it. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then I can sort of, and then obviously, you know, a year later I watch the film and, and it's great and they've all uh, done their thing, but just the, the read through is just to be really exciting. And um, just last question, I'm wondering, I'm sure that there are parts of your casting process that are very different in the last year. Mm -hmm. What in your process do you hope to maintain as we move forward and things hopefully do change and maybe you do get to have people come to your room again? Mm -hmm. But but what do you hope will, you know, what do you want to take forward from this year that you want to keep? Yeah, um, that is a good question. Um, in lots of ways in my job, even though we're far away from each other, the world has become smaller because like we would have a day, we had a day a few weeks ago where we started in Australia. We went, you know, it was Australia, France, it was Paris, a couple in the UK, a couple in Ireland, New York, and we finished in LA. Do you know what I mean? Like, that was one day, it was a long day, but we literally traversed the planet in a day, which was just fantastic, you know? Um, and 
the casting directors, you know, being part of the CSA and being part of the CDG and, you know, and all being in this sort of boat together, there, there has been and there is a real support network. People are very supportive of each other. And, um, and yeah, and it just seems like, you know, somebody's reading from Bulgaria and somebody else is reading from New Mexico. And I don't know. And I, it doesn't even bother me. I don't care. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, and surely with that means more opportunities, I hope. Yeah. This has been really uplifting and inspirational and insightful. And I can't thank you enough for joining us today, Louise. And I just encourage you. I'm sure everybody, we're going to give you a round of applause. And thank just you. thank you for sharing with us. It's been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's a real honor. I'm delighted. Thank you so much.